I'm not sure if COVID has changed the world. Sometimes people say it has. Sometimes people say that the pandemic has fundamentally altered the world in ways we can't fully comprehend yet. And that might be true, but maybe in focusing on the ways in which the world has been changed by COVID, we can miss the ways in which things have remained just the same, only worse. Hmm, you can tell already this can be a fun light video, eh? So for example, take a look at the state-sanctioned violence enacted against disabled people during the pandemic. The state-sanctioned social murder. Often stories like this get rolled into narratives which explain away drastically higher death rates among disabled people due to COVID as simply depoliticized medical issues or they're explained through a narrow and unsatisfying notion of government incompetence. Both of these explanations are not only uh, wrong, but they themselves further the oppression that disabled people face, especially in pushing the notion of disability as a purely medical issue. Instead, in this video, we're going to try and uncover the foundations of ableism, which drives things like disproportionately higher death rates due to COVID-19 or for disabled people. What drives the segregation and social death that's inflicted on them, how such processes are fundamental to capitalism, and how they're systemically ignored throughout society, including by the left. So disability is often conceptualised in a couple different ways. Firstly, as a medical issue to be solved, uh, or secondly, as a form of oppression which comes from discriminating prejudices within society. But there's like a third way that we can look at disability which roots the oppression disabled people face in, uh, within the labour relations of society. As disabled activist and scholar Marta Russell put it, Disability is a socially created category derived from labour relations a product of the exploitative economic structure of capitalist society, one which creates and then oppresses the so-called disabled body is one of the conditions that allow the capitalist class to accumulate wealth. Seen in this light, disability is an aspect of the central contradiction of capitalism, and disability politics that do not accept this are, at best, fundamentally flawed strategies of reform, or worse, forms of bourgeois ideology that prevent this from being seen. In this sense, the root of the disabling society is found not in uh, prejudicial attitudes, but in the very foundations of society, the very uh, labour relations of society itself. Russell points out that under capitalism, the, the body becomes increasingly regulated as a machine where labour power is regularised to minimise the cost of it on the labour market, the cost of it to capitalists. Thus, disabled people are excluded from the labour market, they're excluded from the workplace in order to cut the costs of accommodating for their impairments. And this isn't some vestige of a previous time either, like currently, in Scotland, only about 50% of disabled people uh, on average are employed, compared with 80% of non-disabled people. And this figure falls to as low as 21% for those who have disabling mental health impairments. And it might seem odd at first as to why disabled people remain so excluded from the labour force, from the, the workplace, when it should be easier than ever to make accommodations for impairments. But when we can understand that the underlying labour relations at work, we can see that the logic of capital maintains that labour costs be as low as possible. And even making small accommodations for disabled people runs against that logic. It's actively against that underlying capitalist uh, logic. So capitalism simultaneously forces some people into the labour market uh, while forcing disabled people out of it. This is a two-way thing. It's, it's dialectic. Again, it's dialectic. Everything's dialectic when, when I'm involved, apparently. So in this sense, disability is oppression, which is rooted in specific class relations. Industrial capitalism thus created not only a class of proletarians, but also a new class of disabled who did not conform to the standard worker's body and whose labour power was effectively erased, excluded, 
from paid work. So as disabled people were excluded from waged work, capitalist societies began asking questions about how to manage and care for them. Notice how the agency of disabled people is already being curtailed, already being stolen, uh, and, and they become objects to manage in the sort of biopolitical sense to bring in Foucault. And this is a theme which will be present throughout this video. This is a consistent theme of uh, the oppression disabled people face. So the, the question of managing populations of disabled people is tied directly to the labour market, where the capitalist state had to confront questions of how to manage fluctuating insecure labour markets whilst reproducing the labour power of the unemployed, i.e. keeping them alive and able to work, but making sure they're, they're not comfortable not working. <laughs> You've got to make sure that they're, they're still uncomfortable enough to be forced into the labour market when, when it needs them. Disabled people, though, presented a problem for this sort of biopolitical management of the labour markets because they were forcibly excluded from work. They couldn't be forced back into the labour market because, by definition, they were forced out of it. And one solution which emerged to solve this problem, uh, in a very blunt sense, uh, was firstly through charity and then subsequently through the state, was to institutionalise and segregate disabled people away from society. Increasingly, disabled people have become a part of what Christian Parenti calls a growing stratum of surplus people who, because they are not being efficiently used by the economy, must instead be controlled and contained and, in a very limited way, rendered economically useful as raw material for a growing corrections complex. Thus, the old snake pit mental institution is being replaced with yet another institution, the prison, where incarcerated social wreckage contributes to the GDP by supporting thousands of persons associated with expanding and maintaining the prison industry. And the implication here is that abolition politics uh, is something which we should absolutely and unquestionably be expanded beyond the confines of just the prison and to other institutions which manage and segregate uh, and oppress disabled people. But this segregation isn't just limited to institutions or prisons, things like that. It's expanded throughout society. Disabled people have been systematically denied the right to access education, healthcare, transportation, adequate housing, and many, many other facets of society. They've been segregated away from that. And, and there's been a creation of a raft of specialist, which here means segregationist, uh, institutions for disabled people. An obvious example of this is the exclusion of disabled people from mainstream education and into so-called specialist schools, their confinement within specialist schools. Education as an institution exists to reproduce the labour power of capitalist society, labour power within capitalist society, uh, and it does this you know, by essentially creating the next generation of workers. Disabled people though, as we've talked about, are excluded from being the next generation of worker. So there's no rationale within society to reform education, to integrate disabled people into it, and instead they are excluded and segregated away. This segregation from society, which disabled people are subject to because of their specific class character as disabled people, doesn't just result in poorer living standards and a cl closer proximity to death, though it does do that, clearly, but also segments disabled people away from a full enjoyment of participation within society, a full enjoyment of social life. So thought of in this way, describing the specifics of uh, the management of disabled people as biopolitical, in this sense, may seem a bit inaccurate, uh, and it should be instead viewed as necropolitical. It's uh, is viewed as the management of a population via their proximity to death, both social and physical. And this is tied to the notion of social murder, which was described by Engels in uh, The Condition of the Working Class in 1845. Uh, and while Engels is not specifically talking about disabled people, uh, I think it remains quite salient, uh, quite grimly salient, as the tenor of this and many of my videos are. When one individual inflicts bodily injury upon another such that death results, we call the deed manslaughter. 
When the assailant knew in advance that the injury would be fatal, we call his deed murder. But when society places hundreds of proletarians in such a position that they inevitably meet a too early and an unnatural death, one which is quite as much a death by violence as that by the sword or bullet, when it deprives thousands of the necessaries of life, places them under conditions in which they cannot live, forces them, through the strong arm of the law, to remain in such conditions until that death ensues which is the inevitable consequence, knows that these thousands of victims must perish, and yet permits these conditions to remain, its deed is murder just as surely as the deed of the single individual. Disguised, malicious murder. Murder against which none can defend himself. Which does not seem what it is, because no man sees the murderer. Because the death of the victim seems a natural one. Since the offence is one more of omission than of commission. But murder it remains. Through an expulsion from the labour market and a segregation from society, disabled people are subject to this necropolitical condition of social murder. I've realised that I'm a Scottish person saying the word murder a lot and at some point someone's going to try and co kind of comment saying, sir, there's been another murder. There's been a murder. That might be a niche joke. For, for people who watched Taggart, a show which is at this point like 30 years old. But in talking about social murder, it is important to remember that Engels is specifically not talking about disabled people, but instead talking about the proletariat or the working class, those, those workers. Disability and those expelled from the category of worker have been systematically ignored and often attacked by the left in ways which directly reproduce ableism. I think many of us, if not all, if you're in this channel, you probably will have heard popular communist or socialist slogans which directly invoke the category of worker as the singular revolutionary subject. Even outside of socialist circles, looking at and I'm using heavy quotation marks considering the state of the current Labour Party, but centre-left po political parties like the Labour Party use slogans frequently like the, the party of working people. Slogans like this point to a consistent exclusion of disabled people from the movement because they are, as we've talked about, uh, excluded from being workers. They're excluded from uh, many left-wing movements from being agents, revolutionary agents, uh, because they aren't, they don't fit this category, category of worker, uh, which is so valorised within within a lot of left-wing spaces. I mean, that's not to say that workers aren't revolutionary subjects, but that they are not the or the only revolutionary subjects. And this points to a broader problem which exists among the left in general, but more specifically points to problems of productivist or workerist strains of left politics especially. And that is the valorization of work, the idealization of work as this sort of super valued category, a super valued um, thing. And this sort of valorization, this sort of idealization of work, um, fuck I can't remember though, idealization is not the word I'm looking for right now. I am slightly hungover um, and I can't think of the right word. I will put it on the screen when I think of the right word. Uh, free wine the night, the day before you're filming, bad idea. Um, yeah. So the valorization, the, the valorization of work like this reproduces certain logics which exist within capitalism about the, the value of work being tied directly to the value of a person. And Russell, again, uh, notes that this is a, a particular problem among the left. If work defines human worth and work is the central criterion for human validation, then the worker has their pride and the capitalist has their labour to exploit. Two sides of the same paradigm. 
If work was to be the end all of existence, then disabled people who could not work inevitably would be marginalised and relegated to a corner of society. So Russell notes that notions like this propelled the left and progressive movements in general to embrace things like eugenics, with even such celebrated figures as Emma Goldman being eugenicists themselves. Which is, you know, Emma, come on, we gotta do better. We have to do better. We have to do better than that. And there's of course real material impacts on such valorizations of work and such productivism within the left. And a clear example of this can be found in the Soviet Union, for example, which reproduced with some similarity the same or similar sort of segregation and oppression of disabled people that is found in the capitalist world. For example, the Soviet disability policy has been described like this. With the Bolshevik Revolution and the establishment of the Soviet state and a formal system of classification and administration of disability, the meaning of invalid changed to designate those Soviet citizens who had lost the capacity to work. The definition of disability, or invalidness as loss of labour capacity, was the cornerstone of disability policy in the workers' state of the Soviet Union, where citizens were required to engage in paid labour as a socially useful activity. The citizen's social utility was measured in terms of one's potential role in production, and level of disability was assessed according to a scale of labour potential. Therefore, the Soviet state's approach to disability was not really the individual tragic model found in the US, Great Britain and elsewhere, and so criticised by disability rights advocates beginning in the 1960s. Rather, the Soviet state employed a functional model of disability, based on a person's perceived usefulness for society. And while there remains some distinction between the two forms of ableism at play here, this valorization of work uh, remains consistent and, and we'll get to uh, in a minute, has actually been exaggerated within the neoliberal era. And this led to Soviet uh, policies of segregation and exclusion of those disabled people who were refused uh, integration into the workforce. Many were sent to penal camps and many were sent to segregated educational facilities far from their families and often with just terrible, terrible conditions. And what's more, as Phillips argues, in the Soviet Union, people with disabilities were considered subjects to be cared for and controlled, not active agents or stakeholders. Like in the capitalist world, the agency of disabled people is stolen and they are viewed as a drain on society rather than people struggling for their own liberation alongside those who have been forced into the labour market. The class struggle is one-sided with only workers' liberation considered while not, as it should be, the total reconstruction of society as we know it. There's no need to idealise work uh, and the figure of the worker. No need to idealise our productive capacity. We need to ensure the movement doesn't reproduce ableism in the new society that we all want to build. Now, because I have a problem, I simply cannot talk about this without talking about neoliberalism. Just as the advent of capitalism heightened and sharpened the uh, oppression of those with impairments and systematically disabled them, so did the neoliberal era further sharpen such oppressions. The era that we're living in right now, the neoliberal era, has been characterised by many, many social reforms which have directly and disproportionately harmed disabled people and which reinforce notions of disability as a medical issue to be assessed and controlled by specialists and not disabled people themselves. Again, agency is being stolen. We can start this section by looking at welfare reforms, not because they are the most important way in which disabled people are attacked under neoliberalism, but because they clearly reveal the trends at play. So in the immediate post-war era, the UK and Europe established regimes of state provision of services and welfare. And these are some of the primary objects of reform under neoliberalism. Um, it's often the things that people first think of when, when we think about uh, neoliberalism and what's happened to state provision over, over the years. But before we get too deep into the discussion here, I think it's important to note that 
these social democratic reforms, uh, these social democratic welfare states, are still far from the aspirational ideal that some on the left make them out to be. They were foundationally ableist, uh, as Russell again notes it, referencing Marta Russell a lot in this in this video. Everyone should read her book, uh, Capitalist and uh, Capitalism and Disability. It's in the bibliography. <laughs> On the one hand, there was increased state provision of social services. On the other hand, there was also a greater attempt to regulate the lives of the recipients of these services. This was particularly the case in Britain and other European countries. The Beveridge Report in Britain symbolized this project, and it clearly envisaged an ableist and patriarchal system in which white, male, able-bodied workers were the primary breadwinners, married women worked in the home, and disabled people were defined as a medical problem and relegated to the expertise of specialists. This regime was paternalistic to the core uh, and, and reflective of the trend that we spoke of earlier of um, whereby the agency of disabled people is, is stolen from them uh, and as often the state attempts to manage, uh, manage them as in a biopolitical or necropolitical sense. It ran counter to the idea of independent living, whereby disabled people would be free to manage directly the kind of assistance that they know they require to live freely within society. And this is an important note because criticising the worsening conditions under neoliberalism does not mean idealising the paternalistic post-war regime. Uh, but it's also important because some of these paternalistic trends have been built upon during the neoliberal era. It's not all about completely reshaping what existed before, but in some cases, building on trends that already existed. So the eras of Tony Blair and Bill Clinton and their so-called progressive, modernizing, fucking third way form of neoliberalism saw overhauls in welfare, uh, which were motivated by the impulse to um, move those on long-term benefits off of welfare and into the workforce. The law now says that those who can work have to work. Which, you know, often these groups were, were people, like disabled people, and um, oftentimes they were uh, women, single mothers as well. They, they were frequently targeted by these reforms. So they were trying to move people off of long-term benefits and into the employment market while ostensibly lowering the welfare cost to the state. And I say ostensibly because Oftentimes, welfare bills have increased and the bureaucracies which manage these things are incredibly expensive. There's, there's different logics at play here. So this, this reformation of welfare was to play a role in maintaining low, a low-wage economy and in maintaining a low-inflation economy. Inflation being the great boogeyman of the neoliberal era uh, and one which is spooking a lot of them right now. <laughs> Isn't it? Labor Secretary Alexis Herman told a joint meeting of national disability organizations, the last big group of people in this country who could keep the economy going strong with low inflation are Americans with disabilities who are not in the workforce. President Clinton clarified how the new reserve army fit into macroeconomic planning on his poverty tour. There are a couple of options for ways to keep America's economy growing without inflation. You can bring more people from welfare or from the ranks of the disabled into the workforce. Now, of course, this didn't mean reassessing the notion of work because, God, imagine doing that. Uh, but rather viewed disability as a condition which could be overcome by the individual if they just took enough personal responsibility. In the UK, this took the form of new labour era changes to benefits, which um, changes to unemployment benefits, which sanctioned and took money off of those who, who it considered not seeking work well enough. If you weren't doing enough to look for a job, you were sanctioned and you got money taken away from you. And there was also changes to uh, disability benefits from the incapacity benefit, which is referred to as IB, uh, to the Employment Support, Support Allowance, or ESA, which came with the introduction of stringent intrusive medicalized work capability assessments. I've had two different assessments. I had one uh, which is called the personal capability assessment um, and I had that to claim incapacity benefit when I first became too ill to work in 2007. Um, and that was uh, 
pretty fair assessment of what you can and can't do. Um, you know, they prodded all my deformed bones and they asked us to, you know, how many days of the week I'm just curled up in bed in agony and stuff like that. Um, and more recently, I had um, the uh, work capability assessment for employment support allowance. I had that two days before Christmas uh, last year, um, and that is, is certainly a much more stringent assessment. Um, at one point, I was asked, what stops me from killing myself? Um, it's really that strange that and like cruel it. and weird. Yeah. All of which reinforce the notion that, one, work is the ideal to which we should all aspire to, we should all strive towards. That two, that those who are out of work are a drain on society and should be uh, demonised. And three, the medicalisation of disability, uh, whereby medical professionals have a massive, massive control over the lives of disabled people. And if you're denied disability benefits, your only recourse to funds is this work fairest unemployment uh, benefit that we talked about earlier, which takes money off of you if you're not uh, looking for a job hard enough, which turns welfare into work. The paternalism of the welfare state hasn't been undermined by neoliberal reforms, uh, despite the rhetoric of neoliberalism, but it's actually perhaps worsened. And consistent with the theme, with themes that we're, we're bringing up here, these trends in the UK only got worse during the period of austerity. This was a period from 2010 during which those who were on long-term unemployment or disability benefits were viewed of as a drain of society and in some cases framed as the actual cause of the 2008 financial crash, which is, you know, not true or relevant uh, and, and just basically an excuse to fuck people over, because why not? Um, and there was the introduction of, of, of the personal independent payment, which was a new disability payment uh, called PIP, uh, which took these new labour era uh, alterations to disability benefit and just fucking blasted them right up to 11. A UN report from the uh, Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities found that evidence of, quote, grave and systemic violations of the rights of persons with disabilities in part due to these changes in welfare and the sanctioning regimes that they created to force disabled people off of welfare. So this neoliberal impulse to maintain a low wage economy and create this personally responsible political subject has furthered and heightened the necropolitical oppression that disabled people face. I've spoken about this before, but it wasn't uncommon when I worked in welfare rights to begin an appeal for someone uh, trying to claim PIP or ESA after they've been rejected or sanctioned or declared fit for work and because of the length of time uh, an appeal takes and the immense amount of stress it causes it wasn't unusual that a person would die before completing the appeals process. It is a sick and deathly system and this is ongoing Recently, a report was published from uh, the UK's the Department for Work and Pensions, the DWP. Horrible, horrible department. Maybe they're all going to hell. Um, not to take an individualistic look at it, but they are all going to hell. This is a report that the DWP tried to keep secret because it found that people who are living on PIP and ESA have been unable to uh, meet standard living costs of food, of energy bills, of, of rent, uh, and this is, you know, long before the current cost of living crisis has happened. And as a consequence of this, many, many disabled people have fallen into debt. And this is a reflection of the logic within neoliberal welfareism, whereby those on long-term benefits, uh, particularly disabled people, are viewed of as social waste. According to neoliberal rationale, you can't have living support uh, welfare support translate into the ability to lead a good life uh, or even fucking a standard life apparently or else it will just foster dependency dependency on the state uh, and so disabled people are subject to this widespread necropolitical management and social murder and, and this charge of murder my, you know m maybe maybe you think I'm being too harsh but it, it cannot be denied Another, like the DWP has been found to have a culture of deliberately covering up and ignoring how its welfare assessment process has led to thousands of deaths over 30 years. They know it kills people and they don't change it. It is murder. But the extent 
of the UK's grave and systemic human rights abuses against disabled people under neoliberalism isn't limited to the welfare system, uh, but spread throughout society. So take, for example, accessible housing. In the UK, the highest stock of accessible housing was, of course, council housing, the housing that was provided by uh, the government, by the state through the council. Um, but since Thatcher, I put a stake through her heart and garlic around her neck to make sure she never come back. Oh, since Thatcher, uh, council housing stock has been sold off and not replenished. Uh, and, and there's a worsening and continuing dearth of accessible housing in the UK because of this, directly because of this. And this has also worsened the issue of institutionalisation and segregation of society. Like I've heard stories of people um, moving into an area, um, being unable to find a, a, a council house, being a disabled person, and being told by the local authority that they could be moved into a care home just n because the housing isn't there. It's outrageous. That is an outrage. That is directly segregationist and outrageous. Uh, <laughs> the council just does it. Again, education as well is something which has worsened as marketization and neoliberalism has uh, crept into the system over the past 30, 40 years. For example, the academization of schooling in England, whereby schools are now largely private facilities run by academy trusts uh, rather than the state, has increased and sharpened some of the oppression faced by disabled people. These neoliberal schooling reforms have forced education into an ever more competitive uh, and commodified model, whereby grades and performance standards and goals are fully commodified. As Hunt argues, such trends uh, result in the exclusion and segregation of those disabled students who don't fit within the neoliberal mould of, of targets and goals. And this particular trend has been described uh, in a report from a disabled people's organisation as, quote, severe and deliberate regression of disabled people's rights to access education. So it should be emphasised that the UN's report which found evidence of grave and systemic human rights violations against uh, disabled people wasn't just talking about benefits and it wasn't just talking about uh, the welfare system but found such violations throughout society worsened by the social murder of austerity. Basically neoliberalism has worsened societal trends um, of viewing disabled people who have been excluded from work as a social waste, as a drain and removing their agency and subjecting them to social murder. And this context is all really important to bear in mind as we start to talk about the ways in which disabled people have been systematically killed since COVID. Between January 2020 and February 2021, disabled people accounted for 6 in 10 deaths due to COVID. And it's even been found that when factors like age, underlying health, uh, poverty and whether they lived in a care home are accounted for, disabled people were still disproportionately dying due to COVID. This isn't incompetence. This is a regime of state-sanctioned social murder. These are deliberate policies put in place. I mean, that's something I've talked about before as well, that the, the claim of incompetence, which is often thrown at the Conservative government due to their, uh, due to their COVID policy, often obscures more than it reveals, um, which is the direct policies which lead to deaths of disabled people like this. And, and in fact, one thing that has been linked to the uh, massive death rate among disabled people is the welfare regime and the impact of austerity. Things just got worse. You know, and linked to this are stories like these, whereby medical discrimination against disabled people is on show as fully institutional. What's the rationale for denying people with learning disabilities COVID tests? What's the rationale for for suggesting or mandating do not resuscitate orders. The only rationale is that the lives of disabled people are viewed of as less valuable, that their lives are worth less than the resource drain that keeping them alive would cost. This is the effect of an entire economic and political system which values people by their, um, based on their inclusion within, within the labor market and which systematically excludes disabled people. Their lives are deemed less valuable, and the pandemic showed that with stark clarity. 
and the weighing up of this economic cost or economic health as it was often sort of grossly termed, the weighing up of that cost with health of people was something of a theme early on in the UK's response to, to the pandemic. Like the government delayed uh, on significant measures to prevent COVID early on in the pandemic, citing the cost of the economy as a specific reason why. And this has also been seen by the many, many times that the government had lifted restrictions early, not only without seriously grasping in any change in how society should function to ensure the safety of everyone, but often actually flirting with policies like uh, eat out to help out. <laughs> which contributed to a massive spike in uh, cases of COVID in August 2020, all this while devaluing the lives of disabled people. I know it's mad that we have government policy which is ending free COVID tests, encouraging returning to office, uh, schools open with little or no change to classrooms uh, to inhibit transmission. Yet, yet those who are shielding are left having to remain so as the virus just continues to run rampant. Again, such people are being forcibly segregated from society as the lives of non-disabled people are prioritised and the health of the economy, of whatever that means, is prioritised. And it's not as if the pandemic didn't offer an opportunity to restructure society to some degree to prevent all of this. One thing that the pandemic showed us as a mass disabling event was that accommodations disabled people had been asking for, fighting for, for a long, long time were not difficult to accomplish. Working from home and flexible working uh, was shown as clearly possible. Something that would make life easier for many disabled people but was resisted because of the logic of capital at play. Even now people are being forced back into offices for, for no reason except for the value, retail value of office space and the ability to more easily regulate workers. Even things like the furlough scheme, where the government provided um, uh, up to like 80% of wages, I think it was up to 80% of wages, to those who could not, couldn't work because of the pandemic, showed that the government can very easily provide a decent standard of living for those people who are forced out of work. But it hasn't improved conditions for disabled people who are still fighting against these logics of neoliberalism and austerity. They're still fighting cuts in services, resulting in the human rights catastrophe that we've seen. The pandemic showed us that despite change being feasible, fucking easy even, when our economic and political system works to exclude segregate and uh, murder people due to their ability to generate value, things haven't changed. They've stayed the same, only worse. Disability is innately bound up with the labour relations of society. In forcing some people into the labour market, uh, capitalism has forced disabled people out of work, segregating them, devaluing their lives and subjecting them to mass social murder in a way which can rightly be described as genocidal. And this has been heightened and sharpened in the neoliberal age and despite the pandemic showing us that change is very clearly possible, things have not changed for the better. And one thing that is clear too is that disabled, disability is often full on left out of the discussion on the left. It's just wildly absent and I've been as guilty of this as anyone else. But when we are seeing mass death on this scale for this length of time, silence to that is complicity. We need to make sure that we're amplifying this when we can. Um, we need to be integrating disability and analysis of disability into our analysis of capitalism and we need to make sure that we're not simply reproducing ableism like generations of left-wing movements have done before. We don't just want to take capitalist society and rework it for the worker, but we want to fundamentally break down and reshape all of society, every social relation, and fight with disabled people for total emancipation. And there are small ways that we can begin to do this, just talking about it, to your friends, to your families, to your union, your activist group, I've talked about it with, with groups I'm involved with, 
um, just whatever. Like just talking about disability as a start. Um, that you could listen to uh, disabled creators like Les uh, Leslie X EXP, uh, whose video on disability and capitalism is a, a must watch, a required uh, required watching. Or, or my good friend Aaron Ark are, are talking about disabled writers like Marta Russell and reading groups. There's all these like little things that you can at least start doing. These are just tiny, tiny first steps. And of course, it's far from what's needed. We need to begin fully reassessing how we relate to society and each other and fight for full emancipation together. An accessible society, according to the best critically disabled perspectives, is not simply one with ramps and braille signs on public buildings, but one in which our ways of relating to and depending on each other have been reconfigured. All right, here we are at the end of the video. As as normal, it's time for me to ramble and thank people and all that stuff. Um, so first of all, let, let's 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 do with the patrons. We'll we'll, uh, we'll find some patrons first of all. Uh, thanks to Anita in uh, NSP, Elizren Attercop, Attercop, Robin, Rachel Mixon, Rich, Niels Avelsgard, Tinfoil Pancakes, Kieran Gore, Ag Ghost, Joel, Daniel Hughes, Tamash Kispeter, Paul Singleton. Oh, almost, almost went on to reading someone who's is not on that ten dollar uh, a month thing and no longer get that, um, get out in the credit main thing. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, someone you just you just snuck in, almost snuck in there. Can't get me. I'm on my fucking toes. Better luck next time. Um, and also thanks to uh, Emily who was great in. Um, consultation and reading and talking through this, this video with a lot of help there. Um, and to all the beautiful quote readers, uh, Aranok, uh, uh, Hark of the Storyteller, We're in Hell, um, Ponderful, who's just put out a really good video on the, 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 the notion, the, the autistic meltdown notion, and um, uh, done for, for, for Autism Awareness Month. Um, as she says, we're, sub we're supposed to be aware all month. Uh, that video is well worth a watch. Um, also, if uh, if you want to give money to me, you can go to Patreon and subscribe to one of the various tiers, or you can give a one-off donation via Kofi or PayPal. Um, all of the research into this and is one of the few outlets that's consistently trying to hold this trash state to account for its uh, treatment of disabled people. Um, it's just basically one guy who runs it, um, used it a few times uh, recognising that in the bibliography and then in the references uh, Pring from Pring. So if you've got any spare cash lying away, I know it's fucking lost the living place, it's murdering us all. Um, but if you've got some spare cash um, disability news service, I'll put a link in the description as well. Good, well used support. Um, is that everything? I think that's everything. Uh, yeah. Again, ending with my straight up charisma, as always. Bye, love you, always love you, bye.